Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is the son of one of the greatest music stars of all time, known as the Velvet Fog, the incomparable Mel Torme. His smooth tenor vocals with perfect phrasing and jazz intonations quickly catapulted him into superstardom, first on radio with the big bands, then in the movies and on TV. In addition to his many hit songs, including Careless Hands, Blue Moon and Mountain Greenery, he composed over 250 songs, the most famous and beloved of which is the Christmas song, also known as Chestnuts Roasting on an Open Fire. Mel Torme was also a hugely popular arranger. In fact, he arranged all of the duets and special material on Judy Garland's legendary TV show. He also won three Grammy Awards, including the Lifetime Achievement Award. Our guest, Steve March Torme is a highly successful singer, songwriter, and concert artist who's recorded six sensational albums, including a greatest hits album called So Far. And if you want proof that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, you've got to get his award-winning double DVD concert entitled Torme Sings Torme, which is a beautiful tribute to his legendary father. I'm delighted to welcome Steve March Torme to our show. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Much appreciated. What glowing words about myself and dad. Wow. They're well deserved. Now, well, Steve, thanks. before we talk about Mel Torme, I want to take a moment to pay tribute to your mom, Candy Toxton, who appeared in a number of movies, including Moonrise and Words and Music. And your stepdad was the actor Hal March, who co-starred mm -hmm. in movies like The Eddie Cantor Story and Send Me No Flowers. He starred on Broadway and Come Blow Your Horn. And of course, he was best known as the host of the $64,000 question. You must have had quite a childhood. Yeah. Since my mom and dad were divorced when I was like two and a half years old, I grew up in Hal's house. And all of Hal's friends were the Borscht Belt comedians. I mean, his closest friends who were there at all of our dinner parties were Phil Silvers and Milton Berle and Jack Carter and Buddy Hackett and Jan Murray and Shecky Green. So that's what I grew up around. So it was, I mean, it was great. It was terrific to have that much laughter in the house all the time. It's pretty cool. One, once your family moved to Beverly Hills, you became friends with other showbiz kids like Desi Arnaz Jr., Dean Martin Jr., Carrie Fisher, Liza Minnelli. I've interviewed a lot of kids of big stars and they've all told me that it's nowhere near as glamorous as it sounds. Do you agree? <laughs> well, <laughs> it was probably more glamorous for some of them than it was for me. I didn't get driven to school. So <laughs> yeah, that's true. I think that's a double-edged sword. You know, some of those, there are a lot of people that are second generation, either performers or not even performers, just they're just second generation. They're, they're children of people that were successful in show business. And some of them have come through unscathed and some of them did not. And, and you know, the wounds that were left, whether they were psychological, emotional or, or whatnot, it's tough. You know, I can see where people, you know, trying to emerge from the shadow of a famous parent can go through, obviously, a lot of uh, a lot of trials and tribulations. I didn't really have that. My line is always, you know, if you have a famous last name uh, and you're not very good at what you do, it's not going to help you. And if you have a famous last name and you are good at what you do, it's not going to matter either. So I, I've just tried to get as, as good at this as I possibly can. But that's a good question. It, it is different being a second generation performer. Now, although your mom and dad separated when you were just a toddler, you remained very close with your father throughout his life, didn't you? Yeah, you know, the only time that dad and I were not close was literally geographically, because I lived in Westchester County, New York, and he was out in Beverly Hills when I was growing up as a, as a you know, a young child. And we moved out to Beverly Hills when I was a, uh, just shy of 12 years old. And then I didn't see him that much because he was doing what I do as often as I can is being on the road singing. So he was away. So my dad and I, we really forged the best part of our relationship, I think, in the last 10 to 12 years, 15 years of his life. We got closer and spent more time together, spent more time talking about things. And, you know, it is remarkable how much we have in common. I, I deny it all the time. I go, I'm not like my dad. And then I realized... No, I like trains and dad like trains. I like airplanes. Dad like airplanes. And I like sports cars. And uh, it's interesting. I, I work on a bunch of different shows that I do. And I do a lot of what dad did. Maybe not as well, but I arrange. And I also put songs together and, and try to put medleys that make sense. And I've never thought of this consciously like, well, I'm going to do it because my dad did it. No, it's just it's part of the genes. It's 
I'm thankful. It's part of what I got. Now, rumor has it that your dad hated to be called the Velvet Fog. Is that true? I guess there was a, a radio disc jockey who dubbed him that, heard his voice and said, oh, the guy sings so smooth. And but he's got he's got a little bit of this this kind of a quality to his voice, like the Velvet Fog. And it stuck. And dad didn't like it because he didn't want to have a moniker just, oh, I'm known as the Velvet Fog. But of course, he had a Rolls Royce and he had vanity license plates. And the vanity license plate said L Fog. It was P H O G. So he probably didn't dislike it that much. No, well, he, he recorded Mel- dozens of albums. Do you have a favorite Mel Torme album? Well, yeah, kind, I kind of do. Schubert Alley is a, is a brilliant album. I mean, that's a really great, great album. The California Suite is a terrific album. Reunion, the one that I learned the, the Marty Page arrangement from, the, that show that I do, Torme Sings Torme, those arrangements are the, the arrangements that Marty Page wrote for him and that they wrote together. And that's on an album called Reunion. So those three albums I like a lot. There's one live from the Masonette. That's a lovely album. There are a couple of albums he did with, with uh, George Shearing. One of them won a Grammy. Beautiful album. So I'd say there's probably close to a half dozen. I have two favorite Mal Torme albums. There's one from 1963 where all the songs are about New York. Oh, that's a great album. And there's a live album from 1993 recorded at Michael's Pub in New York. I just love that one, too. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, when dad got sick and could no longer sing, I heard a lot of people say, oh, it's just, you know, we always looked forward every year. We'd make sure that we had a reservation to go see him at Michael's Pub because that was a, that was like a standing thing. He was always welcome there and he sold out every show. It was kind of like, you know, Hefner always invited him to sing at the Playboy Jazz uh, Festival at the Hollywood Bowl. There was always a spot for him. So, yeah, that that album from Michael's Pub is really good, especially for a live album. I mean, it's you can't hide anything in a live album. Whatever is recorded, it's there. And they're really terrific, terrific albums. Now, of all the songs your dad wrote, obviously, the Christmas song was his most commercially successful. He used to refer to it as his annuity. But was it actually his favorite song? Of his? Yeah. I would think it probably is. I mean, it really is a very sophisticated song, especially for how old he was when he wrote it. The truth is the chord changes in that. So it changes keys in the middle there. If you wrote that when you were in your mid 40s, that's pretty sophisticated. He wrote it when he would just turned 20 years old. So my guess is that was probably his favorite. There's a song of his that I have sung occasionally called Born to be Blue, which is a beautiful song. Steve Miller covered it of all people. I don't think dad knew that, but. Uh, that's a, a really beautifully uh, constructed tune. He really loved that kind of writing. He, that's why he liked working with Shearing so much. And that's why, you know, dad introduced me to the, the classical composers, uh, Delius and Grieg, because they were these kind of pastoral, these lovely passages that you heard. They weren't strident like Tchaikovsky. Uh, they were these beautiful, just made you feel good composers, English composers. And I think he kind of wrote like that to an extent. In 1967, Mel Torme appeared in a two-part episode of The Lucy Show called Main Street USA, and he wrote a song and performed it with Lucy. I just love that two-part episode. Did he ever talk about what it was like to work with Lucille Ball? No, he didn't. I forgot about that, that he did that because, God, the, the circles are so concentric. It is just crazy. So he wrote that and performed it with Lucy on her show, huh? Desi, the first person I met when we moved from Westchester County to Beverly Hills was Desi Jr. He and, and his stepfather, Gary Morton, lived up the block on Roxbury Drive in Beverly Hills. And they walked down, knocked on the door and opened it up. And Desi introduced himself to, hi, I'm Desi. And, and I could see he was, looked like he was about my age. And as it turns out, we are 10 days apart in, in age. And we became friends. And at that time, by the time he was... 16, 17 years old, he was working on his mom's show, which was no longer obviously, you know, I Love Lucy in black and white. It was now in color. It was called Here's Lucy. And Desi asked me, he said, hey, you know, the premise of that show, there really was no premise to Here's Lucy. They basically would just have on a guest artist every week and they would basically write the show around them. Oh, we can get Sammy Davis Jr. We'll write something. Oh, Buddy Rich is the guest. Well, we'll do something because Desi could play drums a little bit. So they were having Ann Margaret on as their guest coming up in about a month and they did, they wanted a song for it. They didn't have an original song. 
And Desi asked me, he said, hey, mom want to know if you would write a song for the show. I said, well, I'm flattered, but you know, my writing chops aren't that developed quite yet. You know, I was 16. I, I could play guitar, but you know, I was not James Taylor by any means. And I said, well, what are you looking for? He said, well, just come up with something. So I wrote a song. I presented it to Lucy. She loved the song. They changed it, made it for, for a big band. So I ended up doing the same thing. I ended up writing a song for the Here's Lucy show and Desi and Ann Margaret ended up singing it. So it, it's, you know, the circles are nuts. It's crazy. They are. They really are. Now, yeah. as I mentioned in my introduction, your dad was the musical arranger on Judy Garland's TV show in 1963 and 64. In 1970, just after she died, he wrote a controversial book entitled The Other Side of the Rainbow with Judy Garland on the Dawn Patrol, which painted a very unflattering picture of Judy and generated a lot of anger among her friends and her fans. Did your dad ever talk to you about why he wrote the book? No, we never talked about that. Uh, and, you know, it's ironic because Liza and I became friends. And Liza was obviously one of the people that wasn't, over, wasn't overly thrilled with that book. Neither was her sister, Lorna Luft, who really kind of held it against Mel for writing it. To his credit, and he did this when he wrote the Buddy Rich book, Buddy was already kind of sick and he, was not, he knew he didn't have long for the world. And dad said, you know, I want to write an autobiography of you. And Buddy said, you can do it. He says, you know, Pally, I'd love you to do that. I got one rule, warts and all, leave it all in, everything. And so I think dad was very honest about writing about Buddy. I think that dad wrote the, the, you know, the, the book about Judy, about that show. He wanted to do the same thing. He wanted to be honest about it. I know he had great reverence for her talent. And it wasn't necessarily her fault, but it's, I'm not telling tales out of school. By the time she was doing that TV show, she was pretty hooked on all kinds of drugs that she was given from the studio from the time she was Dorothy. You know, she became the biggest star in the world from The Wizard of Oz. And, and the studios basically said, well, got to be at work at this time. We got to get up and we got to get to sleep. And again, not a big secret. She was doing uppers and downers. And by the time she was doing the TV show, from what I understand, there were episodes where she wasn't as responsible as she should be. And, and dad, like myself, I'm a stickler for be responsible. If you're going to be a pro and you're going to be in the business, be a pro. You can do anything you want. I don't care if you're, this was not dad's philosophy. It's mine. I don't care if you're a stone cold drug addict. If you can do it and you can do your, your work, fine. I don't have no issue with it. But if you can't, then you probably shouldn't do that. And I know that she would forget words or, or not show up on time or be 45 minutes late for rehearsal. And that would, I can see where it would make him nuts because he was very responsible. So he probably wrote about some of that in the book and it didn't sit well with her friends or family. You're absolutely right. Well, I'm glad you also mentioned your dad's friendship with Buddy Rich. Uh, your dad did write a book entitled Traps, The Drum Wonder, and they made an album together in 1978 called Together Again for the First Time. Which is a and great title. And your Great dad started out as a drummer himself, didn't he? Yeah, his first instrument was the drums. And he was a really good drummer. I mean, it wasn't just a guy who could keep time and, you know, we'll let Mel sit in, but, you know, nothing too complicated. No, he could, he could kick ass. He could kick a big band's ass. He was that good. And I think that's part of why his relationship with Buddy was, was kind of funny. Because, you know, Buddy could sing a little bit, but a little bit. He wasn't really a singer. He was more of a talker singer. Uh, and dad was a singer, but M M Mel could really play the drums. And I think it irked Buddy a little bit that, oh, the little shit, you know, okay, so you can play the drums too. I know dad did a couple of appearances on TV, whether it was a Mike Douglas show or something. And I guess Buddy called him up afterwards. And my dad said something, and this is the story, and I'm paraphrasing. And dad says, so what do you think? And Buddy said something like, well, I didn't dig it, man. You, I, I thought you were arrogant, man. You're kind of arrogant. And, you know, they kind of, from what I understand, towards the end of buddy's life they weren't talking to each other which is childish i mean it's not for me to say but that's it's a shame bad. yeah it is a shame i agree with you and i think it was the same thing i don't know if it was the same with jerry lewis i mean towards the end of jerry's life he wasn't talking to anybody so it didn't really matter but i think they kind of might have, might have had a falling out too and you're talking about three huge names in show business with fairly large egos so i can see where there was a clash uh, but you're right. It is a shame because I know he and Buddy admired each other so much. And, you know, drummers, not so much drummers, but musicians today who've not really seen Buddy's stuff will say, yeah, he was a good jazz drummer, but he couldn't play. And I sit there go, he probably could have played anything. I think if you put any kind of piece of funk music in front of him, if he stayed at it, he could probably learn how to play it. 
because he had the fastest hands in the world. And so, but he was that great. The fact that he could do that, you know, that, that West Side Story medley, which was so brilliant that everybody knew him for. And it goes on and on and on. There's solos and breaks and cuts and, and, and he didn't read any of it. It was all memorized. It's like, wow, it's impressive. Now, your dad also wrote a book entitled My Singing Teachers, Reflections on Singing Popular Music. It's a beautiful tribute to the American songbook and the legendary singers that influenced him. Everybody from Bessie Smith and Ella Fitzgerald to Bing Crosby, the Andrews sisters. Your dad was actually quite a scholar when it came to American popular music, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. And he was actually quite a scholar, period. He was really one of the last of the Renaissance men. I mean, you could sit down with him and, and, if, and if he said, look, we'll talk about whatever you want. I just don't want to talk about music. I'm bored with it. I don't want to, you know, I've, I've talked enough about music. He could sit there and talk to you about World War I and World War II aircraft. He could sit there and talk to you about stereo equipment. He could sit there and talk to you about the history of, of MGs and Jaguars. He read a lot. He was a, he was a pretty voracious reader, which is, I guess, once you're on the road, unless you go to the movies, which he liked doing, you know, it's not like he's going to clubs. He didn't drink, he didn't smoke. So he didn't go to bars and hang out. He would read a lot. And, you know, people have asked me, you know, who did your dad like as a singer? Who did he admire? And it's not a secret that he admired Ella. Ella was to him, that was it. It was like, you know, but do you know, if you know about the book, do you know who his favorite male singer was? Oh, was I thought a, you would a, ask me the famous, his favorite female singer. I would have said, Patty Andrews after Ella Fitzgerald. Well, his take a guess who his favorite male singer was. And I, I was a little surprised, but not really, because the reason I'm sure he chose him was because the guy always sang in tune and he always sang effortlessly. Now, we could say Nat because he adored Nat and I'm sure he loved Nat singing and they were very close friends. And my guess is if he was pressed again, you go, really, who's your favorite? He'd probably say, well, Nat's my favorite. But the person he chose was better known for his dancing. Very famous dancer. One of the greatest tap dancers. Oh, one of the greatest... Fred Astaire. Absolutely. He loved Fred Astaire's singing. And he did an album, a tribute to Fred Astaire, as a matter of fact. Uh, and I can see why. Just the effortless, you know, never looked like he was working hard. Just just kind of threw out a tune, just threw out a dance step. And uh, I'm sure dad admired that. Oh, for sure. Now, in 1988, your dad wrote a memoir entitled It Wasn't All Velvet. What did you think of it, Steve? I thought it was pretty good. I thought it was pretty well written and pretty honest. I, and again, he got, he got some people upset with it because he, he went into pretty good detail about his marriages, but he was also pretty honest about his marriages. I, I don't know if he was completely honest, but, uh, but pretty close. And he talked about the trials and tribulations of, of growing up the way he did and that he eventually had to really kind of take care of his own parents that he, you know, they were kind of on the financial dole. But talking about his upbringing in Chicago and how he how he got interested in music and how he learned how to scat sing, because people have asked me, gee, you're a pretty good scat singer. Did, did your dad teach you how to do that? And so I don't know if you can teach how to scat sing. No, my dad never sat down with me and said, here are the syllables you use. And you just listen and you pick it up. Well, he picked up and it's in the book. He picked up his scat passages by imitating famous saxophone solos. And he listened to Benny Goodman. He listened to Woody Herman. He listened to you know, the big bands, the Count Basies of, of the day, and he would listen to certain passages. And that's how he learned how to scat sing. And again, he does go into his marriages to my mom, who was his first wife, uh, and had some less than flattering things to say about her. But it's, it's marriage. What can I tell you? Uh, a, a woman who was married to his second to last marriage was to a, a beautiful lady named Jeanette Scott. And she was an actress in England. And that's who he had his last two children with, my brother James and my, my sister Daisy. And he had less than flattering things to say about her. He, you know, I think he called her, I don't know, white something or other, snow white. And it was kind of a derisive way of saying she wasn't, she wasn't as pure as she you know, made herself out to be. But dad had his habits too. So it, these things happen. I, I personally don't see how anybody gets married four times. To me, Twice should do it. If the first one doesn't work, you go, all right, maybe marriage is for me, but that wasn't the right person. You try the second time, it doesn't work. I think you'd say, you'd say, I like women. I like having a girlfriend. Obviously, marriage is not the right way to go, but that's easy for me to say. And I thought dad was really honest in it. And, and to his credit, he said in the book, a gentleman doesn't kiss and tell because he went out with Marilyn Monroe and he went out with Jane Mansfield and some of the ladies of the day 
beautiful women. And he doesn't go into any detail about that. Like, and the third night I was, no, nah, he, he was a gentleman, very classy. I, I thought, I thought it's a pretty well-written book. So Steve, I want to talk about you now. Oh boy. <laughs> when did you know you wanted to be a performer? Uh, when I was about 13, I started out, my first love was baseball. I would listen to the Yankee games in our basement when I was a kid. And afterwards I started listening to AM radio when the game was over. We didn't really have FM radio. And I was listening to the artists of the day and I would sing along and I realized I was kind of a ham and I liked to, you know, pretend there was a little nightclub down in our basement, you know, with a broomstick singing. I probably wasn't very good at it, but I did like doing it. And I started putting together bands from the time I was like 13, 16, 17. And I realized well, you're not going to play professional baseball and you really do like doing this. And I think you could have a career at it. And I think I'm a good singer now, but I think it only has happened in the last, I don't know, 15 to 20 years of my life where I've really learned some very important lessons that aren't necessarily technical as much as they are emotional. When I started learning to sing for an audience instead of for me, I became a better singer. Well, when you're the child of a great singer and you become a singer yourself, there's the inevitable comparisons to your famous parent. Has that been difficult for you? No, I, I, no, it really hasn't. Uh, fortunately, because I don't have dad's voice. If I sounded just like him, if, if I sang just the way he did, I would have no career. Just be, oh, yeah, he's kind of like, well, you, know, you remember Frank Jr. He kind of sounded like Frank. Well, Steve sounds like Mel. I come from a different sensibility and... My job, every time I get on a stage in front of an audience that hasn't seen me, I know exactly what you just said. I agree with you. When I step on stage, before I open my mouth, they're going to say, well, let's see if he's as good as the old man. I'm familiar with Mel Torme. I've never heard this guy. Let's see if he's any good. And it's my job within the first four bars to make them at, feel at ease and go, oh, okay. Oh, the guy can sing. And he's, it's not a Mel impersonator show. So if I sounded more like him and I grew up in his household, it'd be, it'd been much more difficult for me, but because my influencers were Hall and Oates and James Taylor and, and the Doobie brothers and Steely Dan and Todd Rundgren, my frame of reference is quite different. I, I have a lot of jazz in what I do, but it's from a pop sensibility. And I don't think dad's was We're just a little bit different there. No, but I hear the legacy. I hear the heritage. Hear I hear the jazz intonations you don't sound like your dad, but there's a comfort level. It's almost like a DNA kind of osmosis feeling. I agree. When I listen to your music, I have to tell oh, you. Oh, good. I, I hope so. I, I appreciate that. You produced and sang on my favorite Liza Minnelli album, Tropical Nights. So I got to ask you if you could tell us a little bit about working with her. <laughs> well, you know, that was an interesting project. She was dating Desi. And they almost got engaged, which would have been an absolute disaster. It would have lasted about two weeks. So probably good that they didn't. But they were dating each other and very fond of each other. And I had known her kind of from my childhood, but not as much as she says, because she didn't live in Scarsdale. So I know our paths crossed and we were kind of friends, but we really became friends when she, she was a big fan of an album I did called Lucky for United Artists Records. She loved the album. And she liked the, the jazz influences. And she talked to me and she said, look, I've got uh, one more album to do for Columbia Records and Barry Manilow is supposed to produce it. Uh, and I just talked to him and he can't. He's going on the road. He's got a road tour coming up and it, he simply can't do it. I'd love for you to produce it. I said, well, I'm really flattered to tell you the truth. I don't have the technical chops to produce your album, but musically, yes, I could. I got a bunch of ideas and I, myself and my producer who did my album, we could co-produce it. She goes, I'd love that. So. We went in to do this album and I decided, you know, she, outside of the album, Liza with a Z, she's not exactly a record seller. That's not what she's known for. She's known as a live performer. Of course, Cabaret catapulted her to superstardom. So she was a movie star live performer. She didn't exactly sell a lot of units of records. And I wanted to do something that was obviously completely different from anything she'd done before. And if you're a fan of the record, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. So. Instead of doing the standards, instead of doing the obvious stuff, you know, someone to watch over me. Okay, and the next one, I said, let's just completely flip this. Let's bring in, let's do some original material. Let's bring in, some, let's bring in Steve Morris from the Dixie Dregs to play guitar, someone she's never even heard of. Let's bring in all these different people that will make this a little more of a contemporary sound. 
And then, of course, we brought in James uh, Jim Grady, who wrote Tropical Nights, and that became the, the title cut. And you know the album, that is a New York disco hit. I mean, and it was. In a lot of the a lot of the bars, a lot of the discos, that was a song that got played a lot. It's very flamboyant. It's very uh, what Peter It's very Peter, gay. Oh, very much so. <laughs> and so is Jim Grady. Uh, and very flamboyant. He would come in for the string sessions in a white tuxedo and and just then it was a gas. It was it was an absolute gas. And she loves him. You know, most of her male friends have been gay. And she's very comfortable in that setting. And she was having a great time. The interesting thing about doing that album was I didn't really, I don't know if she, if she or Columbia cared if it sold units I wanted to, because my name was on it, but I wanted it to be a fun experience for her and something different. But at the same time, she was doing two other projects and the album really took third seat. She was, she was filming New York, New York at the exact same time with Robert De Niro over, over at 20th Century Fox in LA. And she calls me one day. We were not recording that day. She goes, oh, hi, darling. Would you like to come down to the set and, and see us shoot the movie? I goes, yeah, it'd be great. She goes, well, come on. I'll leave a pass for you. You come on down. So, all right. So I, I go down to 20th. I'm in her trailer. And there's a knock on the door. She goes, oh, Bobby, Bobby, come in. I want you to meet Steve. And De Niro walks in. And he goes, hey, nice to meet you. Yeah, I really like your album, Lucky. And I'm like, I mean, I had a Ralph Cramden moment. It was like, hum, 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 like my album. You're, 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 nah. so it was really cool of her, but she, you know, that was hours and hours of rehearsal and doing New York, New York. And she was also doing a live show in LA called the act. So she was squeezing in the few moments that she had. Oh yeah. I'm still doing this album too. And she would just kind of learn the songs and do them. And it, it was a square hole round peg kind of situation. Cause she doesn't really sing that kind of pop music. Well, it's not her bag and she did her very best with it, but it, it's just, I don't care. It's a fun album. There's some cool tunes on it. And it was the first time I was going to get one of my songs on somebody's album. And the title cut Lucky from my album, she recorded it. And it didn't work. And I could have left it on there and I could have made money from it. I could have made some money from royalties because it's there. And I looked, my producer and I looked at each other and I said, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And we took it off the album. And I, there, there it went. I, I had my one chance at that time to get my song covered. Anyway, that's what happened. Well, I first learned about you in 1978. Oh, gee. Because from 78 to 81, you were the lead male singer on Name That Tune. I couldn't get over how many songs you had to learn for every show. <laughs> so I got to ask you, Steve, did you enjoy that job? Yeah, that was fun. Now, you know, the, the only thing I didn't enjoy is I never got to sing a full song, obviously. Yeah, I know. I mean, you know, we would start a song and, you know, it would be a, one of these nights doing an Eagles song, one of these, and, and what? Name that tune. So I had to learn the whole song if they didn't hit the buzzer. I still had to do my homework, but, you know, it always got truncated, always got interrupted. I like doing that show because it was fun. Uh, Tom Kennedy was a really nice guy, really nice man. So it was great. And I got paid good money and I was on national television. So what's not to like? It was fun. Exactly. I remember thinking, boy, when that guy makes an album, I'm going to buy it. Oh, and then, well, thank you. When you were part of Full Swing, you sang with your father at Carnegie Hall at the Cool Jazz Festival. And you also recorded a live duet, Straighten Up and Fly Right with your dad, which is on your first album. What was it like singing with him? Well, you know, I only asked him to sing with me a few times. Uh, I didn't want to abuse that privilege because I knew that it would help ticket sales. I knew people would be interested in it and it would be fun to do regardless. I think I asked him to sing with me live maybe four times and at least two of those times, he either had a bad cold, he shouldn't have been out of the house or he was busy and he never turned me down. And you know, I look back on it now and I'm extremely grateful and thankful. He didn't have to do that. He could have easily said, Stephen, I, I'm, I'm in bed. I've got a Vicks vapor rub. I'm, I can't sing. Now he showed up and he did it. Because he loved Carnegie, you. Part, you know, he, yes, he did love me. And considering the fact that we didn't spend that much time together, of course, it's easy to look back in retrospect on a lot of things in your life and go, huh, I could have handled this better. Or I didn't understand this situation as well as I do now. That was one of them. I think our relationship could have been better. It was never acrimonious. It was just kind of distant for different reasons. In any event, to directly answer your question, Carnegie Hall, uh, he asked Full Swing to do it, and he was nice enough to give me the lead line in what is this thing called love? 
because when he did it with the Meltones, you know, it's that nice patchy vocal harmony. What is this thing called love? And he gave me the lead line. And he trusted me enough to sing it. Uh, Straighten Up and Fly Right was really fun. I had decided to do my first, you know, kind of jazz big band album. And I said, look, how would you feel about doing a song with me on the album? Sure. Okay. Well, what song are we going to do? I said, well, I don't know, because it's kind of hard to find duets for two males. Uh, I said, but I've been thinking about it and Straighten Up and Fly Right would work really well. Lyrically, you know, cool down, Papa, don't you blow your tie. So it'd be kind of cool. We could do a scat passage. So he said, all right. So we sang that live because uh, I did an interview last week and someone said, you know, what was it like, you know, having to record separately? I said, oh, we didn't record it separately. We were on one microphone in the same studio. Uh, we did two takes and dad said, OK, I'm hungry. We're going to lunch. That's it. And it was over. And we had it. We had we knew we had it in one of the two takes. So dad got sick. Not long after that, maybe a few months after that, he had a stroke. He never sang again. So I'm lucky for posterity. I have a recording of Dad and myself, and I think that's a really, I think that's a really good single. Uh, it's it's charming. It's kind of fun. We do our little scat singing back and forth, and then finally, I just throw up my hands and I go, "That's it. You win. You win." Because he, th- he throws out some, you know, quadruple tongue. Brr, 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 brr. It was like, oh, I, I'm not even gonna try and top that. So it was nice. It was kind of rev- reverential. We do this. We do this show called "For Kids from One to 92, which is a holiday concert that I do. My daughters have both sung the Christmas song with me on stage. Now they never met Dad, but for them to be singing their grandfather's song with their father, I barely, I barely get through the songs. I've done it with them twice now, and I bar- I can't even look at them because I just, I'll lose it. So the story on this song is, if you've heard it, so you have heard I Remember Christmas. Huh? Yes, it just came uh, out. It's, and everybody can get it on your website, which we'll be mentioning in a minute. Yes. Well, I wrote a song. If you're familiar with the album Inside Out, I wrote a song called A Different Time. And when I do my live shows, most of the time, the, the, people, the song that people refer to afterwards, they go, oh, we loved your concert and thanks for coming out. And we hadn't heard you sing before. Really love that song that you wrote about your, your daughters. What's it called? I said, that's called A Different Time. I said, oh, I love that song. I said, well, thank you. I'm, I'm flattered. I, whenever, whenever an original piece of music is liked, you know, it's a great payoff. One of the guys that I work with in this concert for Kids from 1 to 92 is a guy named Michael Bailey. He's a musician here in Wisconsin. And we do this show and he came to me about three or four months ago and said, you know, I love that song a different time. And I told you the first time I heard it and I said, damn it, you made me cry. And I said, well, I appreciate that. He says, I keep hearing a different title. I said, okay, what's the point? He says, well, instead of, you know, I lived in a different time. He says, I keep hearing, I remember Christmas time. I said, well, fine, but the song's written. It's a different song. He said, well, I think if you change the, the, uh, the title, we change up some of the lyrics and make it more about Christmas, I think you'd have something special. And I, I was kind of reluctant because it's my song. It's like, well, you, you want a special, you can write your own go special Christmas song. This is my song. But it made a lot of sense. And I said, you know, I love the song at a different time, but it's not like a lot of people are going to record it. So I did change the title, changed some of the lyrics to make it more concentric towards Christmas. And we ended up with I Remember Christmas Time. We went back in the studio, re-recorded it with strings. And I'm really proud of the song because, you know, people have asked me, you know, why'd you wait so long to write a Christmas song since your dad? I said, I didn't do this on purpose. This, this was serendipitous. It just kind of came out. My friend liked that title. And we ended up with a song like this. And now we have this lovely Christmas song. Now, of course, I have to mention your amazing double DVD tribute concert entitled Torme Sings Torme, which won Best Vocal Duo Disc at the EMX DVD Awards in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. The concert is fabulous. And the special, oh, the special features are really wonderful, including rare footage and interviews with you and your dad. Congratulations on producing such a masterpiece, Steve. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was really cool to get the, the footage of dad. I mean, I'm easy. I'll get in front of any camera or microphone. But to get some of that old stuff of him talking about how he learned passages, the same thing we talked about earlier, talking about, you know, and I would hear this. I'd be in my bedroom. And my, my, my mother would come and go, Mel, what are you doing? And that, it's great to see that footage of it. But the arrangements are so good. They're so hip. We ended up with a 32-city tour. And I'm so happy that I ended up doing it. 
Yeah, I highly recommend that DVD to every Mel Torme fan because this is a new arrangement, but based on old arrangements that really, really works. But Thank I you. have to tell you that my favorite of your albums is The Essence of Love. Oh, because of the beautiful standards you chose to record. I just want to know, how did you go about selecting those songs for that album? I think you just answered it. I look for I look for the, the ones that that I thought would be the, the, the prettiest to listen to, that we could do something with the arrangements and do a little something different with. So it wasn't the exact same stuff you've heard, you know, and I wanted to try and do stuff that I know the standards and we've heard them, but I didn't want to do witchcraft or stuff that really, really or, you know, my way. There's certain songs I simply won't sing. I just simply won't sing them. But I think the ones on Essence of Love are really lovely tunes. And I got great musicians in California, in L.A. to play on them. I think it's a really classy album. Now, your latest CD is entitled Inside Out, and it's a set of 12 original songs that you wrote. And you also play keyboard and guitar. It's not like your other album, Steve, because it has a distinct pop feel to it. What inspired you to go in that direction? Well, Lucky was the last album that I had done that was all original material. And since then, yeah, there's, there's original material on So Far and there's original material on Swinging at the Blue Moon Bar and Grill. I wrote a lot of those tunes, Almost the Blues and uh, lots of them, uh, Pocket Personality, uh, Swinging at the Blue Moon Bar and Grill. Those are originals and I like them, but they are jazz tunes. They're, they're swing tunes. And I, I, wanted to, I wanted to write one more album that really came from where I really come from, which is kind of pop music. And the influences of the people I mentioned, like Laura Nero and Todd Rundgren and, and Steely Dan. And so Inside Out started in a park in Berlin, Wisconsin. And I was there on a, on a July day. There was nobody else in the park. It was very, very warm. And you could hear the rustling of these maple leaves, these you know old, old maple trees, huge maple trees. And my kids were two and four years old. They were laughing, playing on the swings. And that inspired me to go home and write a different time which we just talked about, the song that became I Remember Christmas Time. And after I finished writing it, I said, you know what? You got to write a whole album again. You, you, you got to sit down and buckle down, take whatever time it takes, but you're going to write a whole album of just your material, nobody else, and you're going to play on it. You're going to play keyboards on it. You're going to play guitar on it. And at least you will leave one more album that is, hey, this is kind of what I do when I'm not doing jazz. And so that's where it came from. And there's some very obvious homages on that album. I mean, the first song a night at the zoo is very obviously an homage to steely dan the chord changes there's a song in there called smoke in the dark and it's one of my favorite songs on the album and it's it's beautiful string quartet and flute and bassoon and that is an homage to somebody and no one has ever guessed who it is and it's so obvious i mean i use uh, i use musical cues in there that are so obvious that they were written by this person and the lyrics in there that are obvious and no one has ever gotten it, I guess, unless you're really a, a strong fan of the artist. And you can hear the musical passages and you can hear the lyrics. And it is a, an outright love letter kind of to Joni Mitchell. Uh, are you still hosting your own radio show in Green Bay, Wisconsin? I'm on the radio more than I want to hear me on the radio. I'm on weekdays, six to nine, and then three to seven, Monday through Friday, and then Saturday, nine to noon. You can stream it anywhere in the world. I'm on a channel here called 91.1, the Avenue FM station, but we're a nonprofit and it, we can be streamed at avenueradio.com anywhere, just avenueradio.com. Now, Steve, no interview with you would be complete without mentioning that in addition to your musical talent, you're a star athlete. You're a two-time <laughs> gold medal winner in the Maccabi games in fast pitch softball. And at the New York Yankees baseball camp, Heroes in Pinstripes in Jupiter, Florida, you won the award for the most valuable player. So do you still have time to play baseball? Uh, no, my, my time is taken up now. I play tennis at least four times a week. And I did, I did get to play in the Nationals, gosh, it's about seven years ago. Uh, the USTA Nationals, which take place in Arizona. Between you, me, and the woodwork, yes, I, I won the MVP at the Yankees fantasy camp. And in my opinion, if you could run from home to second base and not be winded, you could win the MVP. So <laughs> I, I'll, I'll take it. I want to mention to our viewers that you can follow Steve's career on his website, which is stevemarchtorme.com. Well, Steve, I so enjoyed having this opportunity to talk with you about your dad and about your life and career. Thank you well, so thank much you. for taking the time to come on the show. 
Well, thank you. No, you were a delight. It was a real pleasure. I urge everybody to go on the website, order some of the CDs. You won't be sorry. I love Steve oh, March Torme's music. Thank you. And if they and if they want to hire me, they want me to come to their town. I'm easy to get in touch with there because I've gotten gigs from people who said I saw you on a podcast. We have a performing arts center here. Are you interested? So sure, you never know. Please come back to our show with every new project. You're always welcome. Uh, thank you very much. That's very sweet of you. I appreciate it. Our guest has been the one and only Steve March Torme. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.